Good evening, depending on where you're joining from today. Thank you for joining our weekly live stream. My name is Eric Kimberling, CEO of Third Stage Consulting. Uh, Third Stage Consulting Group is an independent and technology agnostic consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world with their digital transformation journeys. And I'm excited for our topic today, which is focused on um, the whole implementation readiness aspect of transformation. So what we're going to do today is talk about um, implementation planning, implementation readiness, sort of that phase zero of establishing the plan and the blueprint and the architecture for your digital transformation. We're going to talk about why it's important, the things to think about as you enter that phase of the project, um, what happens if you if you skip past these things and what you can do to remediate those risks, as well as uh, just what the different components of implementation readiness are. So those are sort of the, that's the, the scope of what we're going to focus on here today. And as always, we're doing this live in front of a studio audience on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So thank you all for joining. And we encourage any questions you have along the way, please just drop it in the chat. Um, both Kyler and I are watching the chat stream here. So we'll, um, I'll, I'll pull some selected questions from the audience as we, as we get going here. I've got some questions to get us started, but would love to hear uh, audience questions and, and comments as well. Speaking of the audience and comments, I'd love to hear where you're all joining from today as well. So if you wouldn't mind just dropping in the chat wherever you're watching, just let me know what city and country you're from. That helps, helps us understand our global audience a little bit better as well. So um, all that being said, while you're dropping in the chat where you're joining from today, I'd like to introduce our panelists today, our distinguished panel of guests from uh, Third Stage Consulting, some of our, our top talent at Third Stage Consulting. And uh, we have with us in no particular order, I'll just kind of go in order of the way I see you on the screen here in front of me, uh, Teresa Richardson from Third Stage Consulting, uh, who's a director uh, on the team here based in the United States. Teresa, welcome to the show. Thank you. I uh, enjoy. I look forward to enjoying this conversation. It's uh, one of the, the bedrocks of what we do, and uh, I'm sure everyone is just as passionate as me is about this. So. Yes, and we're going we're gonna to touch on some hot buttons for you throughout this conversation, including change management and process improvement. So I know those are two areas that are you're particularly passionate about, so we're definitely going to touch on those pretty heavily here today as we talk about implementation readiness and planning. Um, and then we also have Nate Stroer, who is practice lead at Third Stage Consulting, also based out of our, our Denver office. Um, Nate, welcome to the show. All right. Thanks, Eric. Got, got a lot of good topics to talk about today and look forward to uh, sharing some of our experiences. Absolutely. And then um, Michelle Weiss. We have Michelle, who is a senior manager at Third Stage Consulting based out of the United States, out of New York. Um, Michelle, welcome to the show. Thanks, Eric. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. And Michelle has a, a background in, in project management, among other things. So when we talk about governance, controls, project management, all that good stuff, um, that'll be an area that Michelle will be able to help us unpack and understand a bit more as well. And then, of course, we have Kyler Cheatham, who is also the uh, the host of our Thursday or our, uh, gosh, what's the name of our podcast again? It's called Transformation Ground Control. Transformation She's the, uh, Ground Control. <laughs> Transformation Ground Control. I should probably remember that name since you and I host it together. Don't um, worry, I got you. I'm here. Hi, everybody. Good yeah. to see some familiar faces. Um, good morning, Sam. What? Well, I, I guess it's good afternoon, Sam. Um, hi, Peter. <coughs> Good. So we've got you have some repeat guests here joining us live today. And, and again, any questions you have as we get going, I'd love to hear, hear your comments. Um, so I guess just to start, um, and actually in this conversation, this is a little bit different than most of our live streams in that we're actually going to show you a framework. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pop it up on the screen. I'll take it away. We're going to kind of keep coming back to this one slide, this one graphic that summarizes what some of the major work streams are within implementation readiness and implementation planning. But before I start to show you sort of the conceptual framework and we start to unpack that in a little bit more detail, I wanted to talk about just why implementation planning and implementation readiness is so important to digital transformation success. And I guess just to maybe preface the question for you, Nate, uh, to get us started on this is, you know, a lot of times what we see with our clients and with, especially in cases where we come into the picture later where the project's already underway and perhaps they're experiencing some problems and they ask us to come get the project back on track. What often ends up happening is, is there's a tendency to to want to just jump right in to a project, start building stuff, start building technology, and let's just start deploying it as quickly as we can because we've got milestones to meet, we've got a budget, we've got limited resources, so let's just go, 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 go. And one of the things that we see is a lot of times you, 
in most cases, it helps a ton just to slow things down a bit early on to get that right implementation plan and, and readiness plan in place so that you can actually speed things up and be more effective later. And in the grand scheme of things, that actually is the, the fastest way to implement, even though it may not feel like it because you're not getting started right away on the technology stuff, which is where, as humans, that's kind of where our brains go. Um, so I guess, Nate, uh, just to start off, you know, why why is that implementation planning um, so important to transformation success? Well, I think it's it's safe to say that the most most people within an organization have been through a, a technology implementation. So that's something people are really familiar with. Digital transformation, however, is something that most people aren't familiar with. Um, as a result, the organizations really need, um, as you head into the uncharted territories, a, a well-developed roadmap for success. At a minimum, you need to include your milestones, your resources, and your desired outcome. Or put another way, what, what are we doing? Who will be doing it? How long are we going to be doing it? And the, really, the, the most important piece is the desired outcome. And I think you alluded to it earlier, Eric. Mo most organizations we come into, in fact, I would say probably 95% say, hey, we're really good with this step. We know where we're going. Let's just get started. Let's jump in. And I, I often compare it to, to saying, you know, like, hey, we're going to go on a road trip from Denver to Los Angeles. Let's just go. Let's just get on the road and start driving. Well, you really, yeah, you can do that. You might, you might end up in LA, you might end up in Portland. So it's really important to say like, where are we going? How are we going to get there? And what's our desired outcome and who's going to be a part of it. And when, when you address these things and some organizations really do know what they're doing. And so it's a very simple process of just confirming all of that, but it's really important that everyone's on the same page because of this being such uncharted territory, you have to make sure that everyone's real familiar with what you're doing and how you're doing it and what the desired outcome is before you get started. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great analogy The you know, driving from Denver to Los Angeles. Sometimes I'll, I'll take that analogy even one step further and say, it's almost like, you know, you're going to Los Angeles, but you're not quite sure where you're starting from. That's almost how a lot of organizations or how it feels for a lot of organizations when they don't do this implementation readiness. Cause so much of what, what you're tasked with early in a transformation is to figure out, not just where you're going and what that future state is, but sort of where are we today and how do we, how do we close that gap? Um, otherwise, you're sort of flying or driving in the dark, I guess I'd say, um, on your way to Los Angeles without a clear, clear vision or direction there. Um, well, that's a good, that's a good overview. Thank you for that. And again, we're going to come back to the framework and talk about what some of the specific components of implementation readiness are. And I think that'll help bring some of this to life, you know, because right now we're sort of at the high level, but we'll come down into the, the details here in a moment. Um, but before we do that, um, another question for you, Teresa, is that, um, you know, Nate just talked about why it's important to have this implementation readiness uh, phase and why it's so important to success. Um, what are some examples that you've seen organizations or that you know of our clients uh, troubles or the things that they face when they run when they don't take the time or the appropriate amount of time doing this upfront sort of phase zero of implementation planning and implementation readiness. What are some of the consequences or some of the symptoms that you see as a result of that? Sure. So um, three really come to mind. And again, they all tie back to, in my opinion, that three legged stool or that pyramid of success, the people process technology. So you could run the risk of misalignment, meaning are we taking the time to understand our business goals and our business strategy to the technology strategy? Will this technology support that growth in the future? So if you're not understanding where the two really connect and how they collaborate with one another or support one another, you could misalign your, your business goals to, to the technology. Another one is, and, and, and some of the things that I love is, is, risking the the cultural and organizational progress right so looking at your stakeholders do they understand the change do they know what's coming um, are they part of the the conversation to create the solution that they need to help support what they're doing within that change as it moves forward so you have that that or risk of losing or creating a bigger divide in your culture depending on where you start and then the last would be in my opinion um, is that operational disruption right so are we really understanding the total cost of what this is going to be the cost of the organization you really have to look at all of those to make sure 
that you're not offsetting one for the other. So I know in a lot of your videos, you talk about, you know, if we're not looking at that, that picture from a holistic perspective, you can have a huge impact, negative impact to what we're doing. So although your, you know, your implementation could cost a million dollars, if you're not looking at how this impacts your operation, it could be, you know, three to four times higher than that, just to level set and get everything moving back to where it should be. So in my opinion, it's not just the technology, it's it's the people, the process and the technology, and they all need to be evaluated. And by using the implementation, writing this framework, you're able to look at each one of those sections to make sure everything's aligned and moving to where it needs to go. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And you, you hit on this really important topic or this important point of alignment or lack thereof of internal mm -hmm. alignment and uh, that's a really important one because a lot of times when you think about why these projects fail or what some of the common challenges are that organizations face you think of things like you know resistance to change or uh, poor project management governance and controls uh, technology doesn't work the way you want it to you know you think of all these different symptoms but a lot of times when you dig underneath that and you really trace back why those symptoms happened in the first place so much of that traces back to that lack of alignment. And if you're not aligned internally as a team, as you get started and you get going down this path, you're going to spend a lot of time and money, wasted time and money because you're not aligned. You're not on the same page. You're trying to make Absolutely. key decisions that are costing you time and money during the implementation. Even um, the other thing too. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, even with your business processes, you think, okay, this is a technology and we're going to focus on this. But if, if your processes, internal processes don't support it or something's missing or you need to re-engineer it and you don't take the time to look at that, it, it, it's not going to be a good scenario when you flip the switch and, and you're expecting a certain outcome. And then you realize, OK, well, we need to re-engineer this or look at that. You're wasting a lot of time and resources. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing, too, that we we noticed that I would just add to your to your list of things you mentioned that that cause or, or that point to why implementation readiness is so, is so important in addition to alignment is the realistic expectations and just really knowing again back to the the driving analogy yes we're going to los angeles but now we have a clear vision of where we're starting from and how we're going to get there what's the terrain we've got to navigate uh, organizationally operationally all that stuff and if you don't have that up front not only do you have misalignment but you also have unrealistic expectations or you just don't know how long the project is going to take, how much it's going to cost and how much it's going to cost you in terms of resources. And so you end up guessing and you usually end up wrong and then you blow past the budget and it takes longer than you think because you didn't have that that clear vision up front. So it, it's sort of like we're trying to unpack or, or trace back why so many of these problems happen. The good news is you can trace it back to a small handful of things that then percolate and explode into a bunch of other symptoms. So if you can really attack the root cause, which is really what we're getting at here today, that's, that's one of the more effective ways to handle that. Um, what I wanted to do for those of you that are watching, um, and those of us, those of you listening on the on the audio podcast, we won't see this, but we'll we'll try our best to bring this to life verbally. But I'm going to show you a uh, screen or a graphic that shows um, what we mean by by implementation readiness and what some of the major components and work streams are. And I want to kind of walk through each of these one by one, and then we're going to come back to questions from the audience as we as we dig into this. Um, if I take away the slide as we get going in the conversation, don't worry, I'll I'll bring it back. Um, and if you, if anyone wants a copy of this visual, we're happy to share it with you. Just, just email us after the show. Um, but the first thing I, I want to talk about is the executive alignment work stream, which is the, the first, uh, work stream you see at the top of this graphic. And that's one of the major work streams of implementation readiness, which is really ensuring that you have internally at the executive level, you have clarity and definition and articulation of what it is this project and this transformation is going to mean to the organization. And when I say that, I, I think a lot of people think intuitively like they think, oh, yeah, I've done that. We've defined that we need to replace our old system. I'm, I'm not talking about replacing and modernizing technology. I'm talking about just what is it that you want this project to accomplish for your organization? It might be heavily focused on replacing old technology, but why? Why are you replacing the old technology? What are the goals and objectives you're trying to accomplish? And within that, more importantly, what are all the different decisions and parameters and guardrails you need in terms of decisions to ensure that you have a strategy that's aligned with your, your overall corporate or organizational goals and objectives? So this is where we typically would, would help clients through the process of making key decisions around things like, um, for example, 
are are there certain parts of our business that we are willing to just change our business to fit the technology if there are technology limitations which there typically are when you when you do these sorts of enterprise tech rollouts or and or are there other parts of our business or certain workflows or processes where we know that's our secret sauce we know we're different and we're intentionally different because we're that's our dif differentiator as an organization and we're not going to compromise on that therefore the technology needs to change to fit the business so you think about that those decisions which there is no one size or one answer for an entire organization usually it's case by case or depending on what process or department you're talking about but if you don't have that clarity of vision defined at the executive level What's going to happen is you're going to get into the implementation and there's going to be confusion as to do we customize the software or not or do we do we just change the business to fit the software or not and there's and you end up spinning your wheels and wasting a lot of time and money on some of those decisions if you haven't clearly defined those those decisions early on so that's sort of at a high level what that that strategic and executive alignment uh work stream alludes to um, but I want to shift gears and maybe as we kind of do a flyover view here of these different work streams and then come back to follow up questions. Um, I guess for you, Teresa, when you look at the operational readiness uh, piece of that, the operational um, the operational readiness work stream, why is that so important to to a transformation? Well, it, you know, again, in my opinion, if you're only focused on getting that technology in and you're not looking at the simplest question is, is your organization ready for this implementation? Do they have the processes to support the technology? Have we done an operational gap analysis to look at current state to future state and understand that transition over period in between? If those questions aren't asked, there's going to be a lot of rework, a lot of, of wasted time, effort and resources on an organization's end and a lot of missed opportunity for improving your culture and even even the 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 processes within your organization to improve. So, again, in my opinion, operational readiness is just part of the of the pie, just part of the equation that you really need to look into. So you need to make sure that you validate these processes and these requirements to ensure that you're on the same page. Is there any need to re-engineer or update or to create new processes, new roles, new responsibilities for training opportunities, for communication opportunities? It's all part of that whole ecosystem that you need to look at for success. Right. I mean, I yeah. could take a whole hour talking about this because it's so very important. So, you know, yeah. the these are that the foundation of what you're doing. And yeah, it sort of serves as, as a blueprint for for your whole transformation. When you think about think about building a house, um, you need to know how you're going to build that house and in, in, in sort of what the design is, where the walls are going to go, where the foundation goes, where the plumber and the electrician and drywall people are all going to come in and do their role. But what ends up happening is organizations end, end up going to the plumber um, in this case, the system integrator, the software vendor, they go to the plumber and say, hey, tell us how to build a house and help us build a house. And so they just start with the plumber, but they don't have the foundation. They don't have the other pieces in place that are needed, but yet the plumber's there advising them on how to build a house. So that's the sort of uh, analogy that, that we found to be effective with organizations is you've got to treat your transformation the same way you would treat building a house. You need to have that general contractor who, would, who could also help manage those business process pieces of it. And um, that's almost like having an architect on, on a home building project. You've got the architect and the design of what it's going to look like. And then you've got all the other contractors that can actually execute and, and make that a reality. Um, so that's a really good a good point you bring up there. I was going to um, say something about that, Eric. Um, sure. One of the things is that a lot of people think, well, how can I come up with my processes if I don't know what the system does? Right. Yeah. And that, that's a, you know, and the important thing is to get your processes down, right? And then because the system uh, integrator is not going to help you with that. They are expecting you to come with, this is my process. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to do that fit gap. Now they're going to look, say, you know what? Our system does it this way. Let's talk about it. Can we change this? Can we change that? Can, you know, can we do something to make it more like yours? So um, I think that perception that they're going to help you with that is, is definitely out there and it's not correct implementation is expecting you to come with what are your processes what do you want them to be 
in general and then we'll help you with that idea of how does it fit with the software so yeah no, that's a great great point I totally agree with you and, and it's almost like when you think about business processes kind of that level one through five um classification where level one is your real high level macro processes mm -hmm. and then you get down to level five and that's your you know screen by screen button by button what you're doing yeah. in a workflow you know the the system integrators or the, the software vendors are going to help you with that level five you know level four and five level of detail and granularity which obviously that's what they're good at but then you, but you still need that overarching framework kind of that top down level one two three definition of this is what we do this is how we're going to do it and there's certainly going to be some reconciliation you mentioned the fit gap piece of it you're going to have you're going to have a vision of what you want your business to look like and what you want that blueprint to be and then you've got the realities of the technology um, mm -hmm. some limitations in some cases where you just can't achieve that vision with that technology and therefore you decide what do we do do we water down our vision do we put in a third party system to help fill that gap uh, but then there's also in some cases too there's competencies that technology bring to the table that you may not envision early on mm -hmm. which is okay you, you start to get into things like uh, machine learning or some of the more automated tasks that can happen in, in new technology that's going to enable and give you ideas for how you could improve your processes so you kind of have to take top down and bottom up and kind of meet right. in the middle there with the technology driven versus the operational and strategic driven piece of it um so it's a it's a great point about not wanting to defer too much to the to the software vendor and, and how the technology works um, without that clear vision up front um okay and, and back to your other uh arguably your your area of biggest interest and passion teresa is uh is organizational change or the people readiness and i say arguably and really i don't really think that's up for debate i think change management is clearly <laughs> your, your your number one uh, uh mindset when it comes to transformation which is a good thing so this people yeah. readiness uh, work stream here um tell us about that one why is that one so important um, in this implementation readiness phase of a project so i have to be honest with you when, when i saw that particular uh point of uh, discussion today, you know, I started taking notes and writing all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, this is awesome because change, and, and I don't think a lot of people understand when this really happens, but change really begins the minute the decision is made, right? The minute the decision is made from the top or whomever is, is you know, going down this path, that's when you need to understand how you're going to fit change management within the overall plan because change begins the minute the decision is made. And I am like, I'm going to write that on my board. I'm going to, you know, you get these moments of awesomeness. I'm like, oh my God, that's a great saying, but it's true, right? Change begins the minute the decision is made. And a lot of organizations, it's like an afterthought, but people make our organizations, people make the wheel turn. And I've said this 20,000 million times now, you know, unless your process is 99.9% .9 automated, people are involved and you have to take that into consideration when you're looking at a transformation. It's, that's If you want it to work, that's what you got to do. <laughs> you know, some people, they just forget about it. I'm like, okay, you don't want it to work, fine. But it, that's what you need. So making sure that you have your people ready, readiness assessments. Are your teams engaged? Do they understand what the change is? Do they, do, can they articulate it? Do they understand why it's important? How is it going to benefit? Even when you're looking at process re-engineering or creating what we just discussed on, on how our, our processes are, are going to evolve or you know, how are they going to support, nine times out of a 10, you'll have a change in roles and responsibilities. So do your people understand what their new role in their new world looks like? If not, we have to provide training, communication, you know, maybe re-education, whatever, because we have to support them in order for them to support the technology. And that's a lot of times where they miss the mark. You know, we talked about, you know, the, the gap analysis and the processes. You have to do the same thing with your people. You have to evaluate their skill sets to current state to future state. What, what new skills are required in this new environment? And the last is, you know, people transformation. I, I can't say this enough. You know, creating a culture of change mindset doesn't need to stop when your technology implementation is over. You want to grow that. You want to cultivate that because they're the people that are going to see the next opportunity or wave of improvement, of, of cost savings, of, you know, a, a defect uh, uh 
calling out a defect, making sure that things are running appropriately. We're giving a service to somebody or giving a product to somebody, and they're the first ones to see an opportunity to make it better. Yeah. And I know yeah. we only have a half an hour, but I could go on and on and on. It's <laughs> it's important. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's uh, definitely important. I'm going to share a few comments as we're getting in here. And I'm actually going to come back to some some audience questions in just a moment. But I want to get through these last two work streams a bit uh, first. But, um, you know, just some great comments here from from Chris on LinkedIn. He mentions that getting the as is processes <coughs> can take months. And then uh, someone else on LinkedIn, I don't see the name of who, who posted it, but um, don't underestimate the effort it takes to educate your system integrator on your business, which can then inf which then influences your business processes. Um, so that's a great point too. And, and the better job you've done of defining your your operational plan or your your, your future state business processes and your change management plan, the better your system integrator is going to be able to add value to the project and sort of fit within fit within your vision for what the project is, rather than making it about them and their vision. Um, and, and that's a that's an important. Uh, dynamic or, or mindset shift that the organizations often face. Um, okay, Nate, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit. And we talked about, so we talked about strategic alignment, we talked about operational readiness, people readiness, and then there's technical readiness, maybe help us understand that at a high level in terms of um, why that work stream is so important? Or what is it? And why is it so important? <clears throat> well, I think this goes, <clears throat> goes back and it's, we're starting to hit a, a theme with all of these different readiness pieces of the project. But I think it really, again, comes back to where are we now? Where do we want to go? And how will technology help us get there? And when we say, where are we now? I think it's important to everyone or organizations and, and people for, for all that's worth uh, tend to focus on what's not working. But I think it's important to say, what is working? What, what's, what are we doing well? And how is technology helping us to do that well? And then what are the challenges and how can this new technology help us to get to where we want to go. But I think it's also important and, and folks tend to, and organizations tend to focus on one technology. And, and it, it usually is around an ERP system, a CRM package, um, a human resource platform. But I think it's really important to know that all of these work in the overall technology landscape. So all of your systems really need to not only work together today, but work together in the future to support your vision. And I think Chris on in, in looking Chris uh, McPartland, I, I think you made a really good point in one of your posts here. And that is the technology may already be there. And we we've had organizations before where you come in and you say, you know what, I think we're actually you're focusing on an ERP implementation. Maybe this is something that you already have in place that we just need to optimize. We just need to build the people and the processes around the technology that's already there. So it's really looking at all of the people, process, and technology, know that they don't exist in a bubble, and then finding out again, back to those questions. Where are we now? Where do we want to go? And how will the technology support that vision? And I think um, just to add to that is also making sure that the people that are going to be working within your organization with that technology are you know, prepared or getting support to get to a point where they're going to be able to support that. So um, a little bit of that people training, people change management for them, uh, the IT folks, which is, you know, have a bigger um, role sometimes than than end users specifically, just because they're going to be, you know, implementing integrations and other systems to support the, the, the bigger system, right? So. And I yeah. think one of one of our clients earlier this month made a really good point. He said, you're dealing with end users that are used to a rotary dial phone and we're giving them a smartphone right now. It's still a phone. It still communicates from one person to another, but it's a whole different way of doing it. So you can't just assume, OK, we're going to take the old phone, take it out of the wall, hand someone a smartphone. They know how to use a phone. There's a whole process of not only training people, but getting the right people in place to take advantage of the technology. And I think that second piece is really the most important one. And that is some people not, not replaced, but you might need to get some people in there with different skill sets and different ways that they do their job and with the way they um, work within the organization to really take the best advantage of the technology. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, that technical work stream is also important because it, 
provides the architecture and the integration for how technologies will tie together. Even if you're implementing a single ERP system, you've got to tie together different modules within that system, and you've got to have an architecture for that. And not to mention the fact that it's highly likely, if not you know, 90% plus likely, that you're going to have to integrate your core ERP system to some other technologies, whether it's a regulatory system or a you know, a, a industry-specific type of solution or whatever the case may be. Um, okay, and then Michelle, help us understand the last work stream here at a high level, the project governance and planning. What is that work stream and why is it so important during this phase of the project in particular? Sure, I mean, this is the, the work stream that helps you determine uh, how are things going to be managed, who's going to manage them, um, so the first one being the project governance is, you know, how are you going to escalate things? Who's going to be the person that things get escalated to? Um, how are you going to project manage this? Are you using certain software to do that? Or, you know, just kind of getting ready for, uh, that project management role and, and how things are going to work. Um, also, I think part of this is, um, and it may bleed into the others is, you know, sometimes people assume that ex even executives know what their role is in a project, right? They you just assume they know. Well, this is also part of defining what their roles are going to be and what is expected of them. Um, so setting some guidelines as to, okay, you're part of this project team. These are the expectations for your role. So you're the executive sponsor. This is what's expected, right? You are available. You attend certain meetings, et cetera, so people know what um, to be ready for, uh, for the project. Um, also in building out your project team, um, you know, realizing how much time you're going to need from those people and does it make sense to for them to be doing their job as well as being part of the project. In some, in huge implementations, no, that does not make sense. You're actually gonna need those people full time. And so figuring out a way to um, support them in that by backfilling those positions. So I know that that's a big thing in, in really huge uh, implementations where, you know, again, people don't real, companies don't realize that that's gonna have to happen. So they're gonna have to hire people to take over some of these very important roles, but you need those really important people as part of the project to define all of these processes and, and you know, make, make the, the project work. Um, and then it's also looking ahead of time about what might be risks in your, you know, organization. So getting those risks down and um, starting to think about how to mitigate some of those risks. Uh, so I yeah. don't know what anyone else has to add to that, but those are my my few comments. Yeah, some of the uh, the the decision making is a really important one that you mentioned, which is the you know, how do we make decisions as the project goes? Who makes the decisions? Mm -hmm. um, are, you know, a lot of times organizations delegate decision-making about key business processes and strategic decisions. They delegate that to the project team in the spirit of delegation and just getting people involved. So it's, it's typically coming from a good place, but what ends up happening is you lose that alignment. You lose that alignment with your, with your future state strategic vision if you don't have that governance in place. So it's not just about keeping a project on track, making sure you finish on time on budget. It's also about making sure that you are delivering a transformation that aligns with the executive and the, the strategic alignment strategy of the organization. And it's um, also um, selecting the project team all the way down to the user, you know, the UAT people. So the users mm -hmm. are going to UAT. So, but they are communicated to about how the project is going. Maybe they're not involved in obviously in all the meetings, but they know that this is a, a, a role that they're going to fill and get them involved, right? I think there was a question earlier about, you know, they don't listen to the end users. How do they get involved? Well, UAT would be the place where, where they're involved specifically, but the idea is that your organization has chosen representatives to be part of the project that should know the processes and the things that you're doing to communicate those to the project team and hopefully get, you know, some of those things into the into the project. Um, you know, you can't involve everyone in projects like this, but the UAT piece is where those users get to play with the system, test what, you know, the processes that have been set up and voice their opinions. This is working, this is not working. And that's their chance to really um, give that input, I think. So 
um, yeah, they need absolutely. to know that they're going to be part of the project even from the beginning. And you know, obviously, they're going to get know that they're going to get training on, an, especially if it's a brand new system, right? Sometimes that you switch from one platform to another, and it's completely different. Letting them know that yes, you're going to get some training. Everyone's going to get training, and that's that comes in Teresa's, you know, communication. Communicate with the whole organization, not just the project team, um, as to what's right. what's going on. Yeah, absolutely, and that was a good segue because I, I actually had that question queued up to answer next. So you you had it, you had a perfect transition here into some of the audience questions. And so thank you for paying on YouTube for asking that great question about uh, user involvement. Um, you know, while we're on this thread here of, of people and change, um, you know, Teresa, I'd be curious, uh, Teresa and Nate in particular, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, but this is from um, LinkedIn. The comment is the scariest part of digital transformation is the poor level of communication. Some global mm -hmm. managers believe their own perception is the only valid, the only one that's valid, and they do not value the experience and limitations of end users and, and medium to low managers uh, within the organization. So how do you overcome that? Teresa, maybe we'll start with you. You know, when you talk about communication and the poor communication or or the I think they're also this person's also getting to something even deeper, which is the the managers thinking they're right or only their perception is valid. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I, I know it's a huge question, but <laughs> what, what's your first you pass see the that? wincing in my face like <laughs> well, interestingly, you know, most change, impactful change comes from that middle layer or the middle manager area because they're the ones that are that conduit between upper and, in my opinion, team member level uh, interaction with the process of the technology. Oh, my goodness. You put a smile on my face, Kyler. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, making, I mean, when you have managers like that, I mean, in my opinion, a manager doesn't need to be the one driving the change if an organization is really engaged because you have change agents, you have the people that that want to see this change move forward. So you don't really have to leave it up to that manager um, if you really want to make that switch. Uh, in my opinion, change is an organization's responsibility. So the communication, it, it's like a cascaded communication plan where every level of an organization has the idea of the change, but how does that change impact them at their level of influence is very important. Um, again, I'm not, the, I'm not the type of professional that would allow or permit one level or one person to, to just stop everything. I think it takes an entire, <laughs> entire community to, to make, embrace, and really move that change forward. So if the question is, how do you get around that? I think the person asking that question really knows, right? You see the problem. So step up and fix it. Because mm -hmm. honestly, everyone within an organization, they're not there just to be there. You're taking time from their family. You're taking time from their you know, lives. They, they're there because they want to be there. They want to do a good job. So if you see it, you know what? Address it. So right. that's what I would say. Yeah, it seems like it's a it's a balancing act between, you know, we talk about executive alignment and that clarity of strategic vision. So on one hand, you kind of need a somewhat of a top down, uh, even though that's not a cool word to say nowadays. It's all about bottoms up and sort of leadership and stuff like that, which is great. But you, you do need that top down direction and, and strategic framework. But then you also need you can't overdo that either. You need to have that sort of bottoms up um, involvement of end users, but also the communication to and among different departments and different people within the organization. So you kind of have to do both and you have to find that right balance for your organization. I mean, to be honest with you, if, if uh, you know, if worse comes to work, you need to, you need to talk to what people listen to dollars. You know what, mm -hmm. if, if my manager or whomever isn't, isn't making it happen and senior leadership's like, well, why tie it back to the dollars that that'll get their right. attention. You're just wasting ten gazillion dollars because this isn't happening. You'll see. You'll see some changes. So I mean, there's plenty of ways around that around that barrier. And uh, here at Third Stage, we are we are very good at identifying what they are and just kind of like blowing it up. And yeah, absolutely. Happy, you know. So. Yep. And then here's an interesting comment from Chris um, Simmons on 
LinkedIn. He says, for some people, change can be difficult, especially those who may have been with the company for many years. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a great point. If you have a highly tenured staff, you know, change management is just going to be harder. If you're a an older, more established organization, change is just going to be harder. And uh, a lot, I think too many organizations underestimate that. And they think, no, 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 it's not going to be yeah. hard because our people hate the old green screen system. So they're yeah. going to love the change. Well, they maybe they will at the end of the day, but it's going to be a very painful process. I think that's but, the part that people don't fully understand. Honestly, I think that's a pot of gold in my mind. I mean, you have all that tenure, all that experience. And, you know, I know you just maybe saw me get a little excited there, but that's what it is. It's like a pot of gold. It's 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 all this experience and this you're there for a reason. You've been there for 40 years. So you love your job. You're passionate about it. So let's tap into that. Let's figure it out and have them become the cheerleaders. I mean, just because someone's been there 40 years and they're using a phone on the wall versus someone out of college who has a super duper fast new version iPhone that you can look at and it turns out it doesn't mean we're going to discount the person that's been there for 40 years. In my opinion, that's a huge opportunity. That's a huge pot of gold, you know, and I tap into it. I'd be like, hey, let's talk. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, I'm just going through. We have a lot of great questions here from the audience. I'm actually having trouble uh, <coughs> getting, getting through them all or, or just kind of picking the ones that go with the flow here. Um, you know, here's a here's an interesting question or, or comment from uh, uh, Furkan, Furkan. I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name too terribly on LinkedIn. He, he's responding to Chris McPartland, who we had showed a comment from him earlier. I think, Nate, you mentioned him earlier. Um, he mentions that another crucial point is following these processes, which are related to relevant trends, because it changes quickly, in my opinion. Um, so I guess, you know, maybe I'll, I'll turn that into a question. What about, you know, how do you, from a process improvement perspective, how do you um, ensure that you're, you're taking advantage of sort of best practices or, or um, improved business processes that can deliver real business value? Um, how can you do that? But at the same time, you know, do that in the context of a very rapidly changing tech environment where technology is constantly changing and the world's changing. How do you how do you sort of define that moving target uh, in a transformation? Or do you have any thoughts on that, uh, Teresa? Maybe we'll start with you on that. Uh, I, was gonna, I mean, <laughs> I could talk all day on this again, but, you know, when you're looking at how the rapid movement of technology is occurring from your industry as well as your organization, just because it's moving fast, is that what you need for your business is my question. So, yeah. I mean, flavors of the month, I mean, I hear it all the time, it comes and goes. So if something's moving quickly and, and you know, it, it's something that you want to, to deploy, step back, take a look at that, the, the strategic alignment and how your processes and what are your strategic goals, does that, is that the right fit for your business? Ask the people who are touching the process. You know, it, it might be a shiny bell here, but when I'm involved in the process, will it work for me? Will it get a better service, a better product, a better whatever? Am I going to help my consumer, my customer by changing these processes and making it shiny, faster, whatever? I, I think even before you want to do that, you would really need to look at whether or not it's the right thing to do for your business. Yeah. Yeah. And here's a, and speaking of speed and uh, change, um, here's a question I want to maybe see what your thoughts are here, Nate, uh, on this question again from Chris McPartland. Um, but I feel like this question really gets to the root or to the, to the heart of why <coughs> implementation readiness is so difficult for organizations to think through and to, and to be patient with or, or to, to actually take the time to do is, uh, I'll, I'll say it in his words because he says it better than I probably would have. Um, but he says, I'm always under so much pressure to start delivering change as there's always excitement and momentum in the early stages. So how do you ensure you get the time up front in an agile, impatient world? And I think that's a brilliant question because that that is the problem with implementation readiness and why so many companies skip past it is because we live in this agile world. We, we want to move fast. And it's sort of like it's sort of like a human psychology sort of thing where if we're not building technology, then we're not making progress. I can see and touch the technology but I can't see and touch all this implementation readiness stuff. So let's just get past it in the name of agile and go, go build some stuff. And that, that creates a lot of problems in my opinion um, that that can lead to problems later. And, and that's hence the whole reason for this, this entire topic and conversation. 
But what what are your thoughts on this, Nate? I mean, have you seen this before? How have you seen our clients overcome that? What, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, at, you know, and and that is a great point. And I think when I when it, <clears throat> when you ask if we've seen it, I think with every client we've seen it. And I think it's it it really goes back to the the point. And I'll use your analogy, Eric, but it really comes back to the point of starting from the beginning. Where are we now? Where are we going to go? And then really building a good plan on how you're going to get there and communicating. And um, I'll, I'll try and hit in all three of those. But it again, kind of using that analogy of building a house, it's it's sitting down and saying, what do we want out of this house? Are we building a are we building it for a family? Do we want a lot of living space so that we can entertain a lot? That sort of thing. That's the vision. And then really sitting down and saying, what's the plan? And 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 saying, do we you know, we have to dig a foundation. We have to frame the house. We have to get the plumbing and the electrical. And then really the most important piece in my book <clears throat> is communication. And I think and I think the communication has to be consistent. It has to be um, frequent, consistent and concise. And, and I think it as long as you can take your communication and tie it all into where are we now? Where are we going? Get, get it in front of people, if, whether it's weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, at staff meetings, whatever that is, and then, and then make it concise, make it relevant to what the end user sees and what their piece is in the overall project. So people, people don't want to read five page emails, but they, they want bullets. They want to know what the change is, what's coming up, what's their involvement in it, and what can be expected of them. And I think if you do that, it it, you, it lets people know that, again, here's where we're going. The end, the end goal is to build a house that we can all live in. And yeah, it's not exciting when you're seeing a hole dug in the backyard and a foundation is being poured. That's not really something you can put your hands on. But as long as people know you do this before you do this, before you do this, and then we all move into the house, it gives them an idea of where, where you're going. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I want to add to that is, you know, going back to the earlier part of our discussion, you're talking about, you know, what risks are we in danger of? And I think one of, one of the things that just popped in my head as he was uh, so eloquently describing that is the risk of a restart. So that's a very costly thing, not just in money and resources, but in the buy-in and adoption that you've created up to that point for your organization. Um, when you don't really take time, take a step back and look at what are we really doing? Where are we and where do we really want to go and what that piece in between is? If you don't do that, then you're, you know, you're moving along your timeline. You find something that you need to adjust. You got to stop. You got to adjust. And then that whole cost of a restart is huge. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a great point. Um, and I agree with that, by the way, it's a lot cheaper and faster to do it right the first time than it is to mess it up and th think that you're speeding things up and actually you're just headed faster towards a failure. Uh, making sure you get that, that right up front is, is super important. You're um, headed to the brick wall, get it? The brick wall behind me. No. <laughs> <laughs> boom, boom, boom. No. <laughs> little and digital transformation say... humor here on the show. <laughs> If you do a restart, then that's where people start getting that exhaustion of, yep. you know, I think there was a question about change ex exhaustion, mm -hmm. right? If you're going to have to restart something and they're not going to, they're going to be too, too exhausted from all the change before and it didn't work. So why would I pay attention now? So it definitely has a huge effect on, on morale, I think, Absolutely. as well as uh, putting the project in a, with starting restarting a project with higher risk because your people are just like okay i'm over it right so yeah um, i five across the room michelle that was mm -hmm. awesome <laughs> yes yeah no that's a great point and, and i guess just in the interest of time i know we're going to lose at least one panelist here in just a, in just a few seconds uh to a client commitment but before we lose anyone from the panel um i want to ask sort of this capstone question or this closing question here which is um you know, what, what closing advice would you have for an organization that's maybe in the midst of a transformation? Um, and what, what, what should they do to get started? I mean, when you think about implementation readiness and doing some of the stuff we talked about here, 
you know, how do they how do they get started on it, whether they're just starting their project or perhaps they're already part of the way through the project? You know, is there are there pieces of this you can work into your plan sort of midstream if you're already down the path? Um, in other words, is it better late than never to do some of this stuff? I guess, you know, uh, Teresa, why don't we start with you? Because I, I know you're the one we might lose first. In the, yeah, in the abs time yeah commitment. absolutely. It's it's you, it better late than never. Um, will it be more work? Yes. But will you uh, appreciate that when it's done the right way? Absolutely. Um, again, people contact us for change management. Let's just say even BPM, middle, almost all the way through. It is an uphill climb. However, it can be achieved. Um, one thing that I would say in terms of advice is to take a step back and breathe. I know that excitement is created. We want to do this. It's the right thing to do. But take the time and, and have that due diligence and, and really look at, OK, what is it that we're doing? Why are we doing it? Where do we want to go with it? Right. And then who are the people we need to bring to really evaluate from not just that unbiased view, but that agnostic view? Like, are we doing the right things? A lot of people are going to tell us a lot of things. Yep. Bye, bye, bye. Take this, you know, purchase this, purchase this. But is it right for our business? That's a question you have to ask. And if it isn't, what do we need to do to fix it? Yeah, great point. Yeah, thanks for that. How about you, Nate? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it. I think it's real simple, and I think it's uh, create the vision, create the plan, and and so create the vision, plan the work, and work the plan. And I think that that's that uh, again very oversimplified. But as long as everyone's on the same page of where the vision is, as long as everyone agrees on the plan, and as long as you're working the plan, like Teresa said, it's never too late to start. But it's really important to know where you are and what's the plan to get you caught up and what's the plan to get you to ultimately where you want to be and be realistic about the challenges that are ahead and, and then work the plan. Yep. Great point. How about you, Michelle, any closing thoughts or recommendations to organizations that are considering or, or wanting to address some of these implementation readiness concepts? Sure. Yeah. I, Nate just covered kind of, if you're, in the middle of one so i want to give advice to people that are just getting started and like also teresa said it all starts the moment you decide you want to make the change and some of some of the implementation readiness steps can start happening while you're choosing your software right so that way you maybe don't feel so rushed to try to get into implementation so thinking about who who those important people in your company are that you might want to try to retain for the project um come you know, starting to communicate about this, forming some excitement to get ready for that implementation. So, um, you know, some of the process stuff might not be able to happen until you've chosen the software, because now, you know, you have some idea about how they do things a little differently, but um, a lot of it can start sooner and, and it, it's never too soon, I think, to start thinking about what, how you're gonna communicate, um, you know, with the change management plans and things like that, so start yeah. early and it'll get you ready and faster yeah great point i don't think i've yet met a client that said yeah we started this whole implementation readiness thing too soon we should have waited <laughs> or or the change management stuff we should have waited on the change management we started right. way too early on that no, i've never heard a client say that <laughs> um, well good well i want to thank you guys for being here today I really appreciate your your input and involvement um uh, taking time out of your out of your busy schedules and also want to thank the audience for being here today and great questions. We had a lot of really good questions, including some we didn't have time to get to. So I really appreciate that. Um, I've also, if you're interested in that framework that we that we showed you on the screen here, um, you can actually download that. We'll, we make that available to the community for free if you want that as a, a reference point. Um, I think Kyler has dropped that in the chat box um, of the chat here. And we'll also put it in the description field, um, depending on where you're watching here today. So be sure to check that out. If you want to download that, you can do that on our website. Um, so thank you very much. This this uh, interview will be part of our Transformation Ground Control podcast that gets released a week from tomorrow. So you get to see sort of the live production here and you'll see this interview as part of that show that's released. And um, I wanted to thank everyone for your time. Uh, Kyla, I apologize. We couldn't get Meadow, uh, Meadow's opinion on some of this stuff. I, I know. Saw that right. At the end, she, she joined us on camera, but she, she's yeah. not quiet, although she's not quiet now. Um, no, <laughs> we're not quiet. That's not a Cheatham gene that we all share, but I will share. <laughs> 
my final thought, which has kind of been the thesis of my experience on this live stream, is when it comes to digital transformation flexibility, right? We talked about kind of that analogy about going from LA and knowing where you're going from. Well, LA has heavy traffic that's not a controllable, and Meadow here is not a controllable. So a lot of times parenting to me is a lot of strategies when it comes to digital transformation. Now, did, did I see that right? She has a marker in her hand. That that doesn't look good. Yeah, we've gone from dumping water to slapping me with a tortilla to marker. So it's been a very eventful live stream, and I'm looking forward to actually being able to add value to the conversation. I do appreciate everyone, um, you know, being being caring when it comes to working parents. You know, a lot of times. Absolutely. Yeah, we do the best we can, right? <laughs> it, it makes it more entertaining and fun than if we just talked about Maybe for you. Yeah. Maybe for you. <laughs> yeah. At your expense, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. But looking forward to unpacking this great conversation. Please subscribe to our Transformation Ground Control podcast where you, you can get that wherever you get your podcast. Also say that the link I dropped in is for our digital transformation work streams. Our implementation readiness framework, as well as our quality assurance framework, will be available in our description notes so that you can download those. I also recommend following Teresa, Nate, and Michelle on LinkedIn as they put out thought leadership a couple times a week and are always interested from hearing from you. So thank you, as always, in the engagement. We look forward to um, you know being able to to um, unpack that on our Transformation Ground Control podcast. All right. Sounds good. Well, thank you, everyone, for your time. Bye. Thanks for being here. Have a great thank rest you. of your day. We'll Bye, see you next guys. week on our live stream. Take care. Bye. Bye.